Um, I have the pleasure to introduce Dr. Peter Tanner. Tanner um, is a civil engineer who got his uh, MSc from ETH Zurich and his PhD from uh, Universidad Politecnica de Madrid. Um, and he's worked in, uh, steel, at the Steel Construction Institute at ICOM in Switzerland, in, in Lausanne. And in uh, 1996, he co-founded a consulting engineering company, SESMA, and uh, that focuses on design uh, and refurbish, refurbishment of uh, buildings and works of art. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you here. He has a very intensive activity at the Eduardo Torroja Institute in Madrid, and also uh, he serves in many committees at the Eurocodes, in the Eurocodes, so it is a very exciting opportunity to listen to him talking about uh, falling victim to increasing specialization and standardization, which is a bit of a contradiction to the work on the Eurocodes, but I'm sure he'll explain all uh, what is uh, how we can solve this problem. So thank you very much. You have the floor. You're welcome. Thank you very much uh, to all of you for coming here and of course for the invitation. It is a pleasure for me to be here and to be a good neighbor. And I hope that I will be able to explain this uh, rather esoteric title at least uh, at the end of the lecture. Yes. Um, okay, so let's start. The, the fundamental goals of design of any structures are in principle always the same. Yeah? We need reliability, functionality, economy. I added here also the environmental efficiency to be complete and also elegance. And this is also valid for hidden structures because uh, their behavior usually is, is better, yes? Now, the successful translation of constraints, of all constraints, into a solution that means, meets all these goals depends primarily on the choice of the type, the layout, and the dimensions of the system, the load-bearing system, the type of foundation, cross-sections of all the members, the materials used, and also the manufacturing and assembly processes. There are, of course, interactions between all these aspects, and all of them, they have to be compatible with the boundary condition. So, in principle, this is the most important step in any design process. Now, if I look back a little bit in my childhood, my father used to take me to a place where an elderly man was playing with uh, model trains. And he also had this kind of uh, sculptures in his garden in wintertime, of course, with his eyes. I didn't understand. They were very funny for us as, as kids. Then later I had uh, Christian Men as a professor at the ETH in Zurich. And then I started to understand. He used to tell us that structural engineering is not simply an applied science. It, it combines actually mechanics and aesthetics. When we in the non-Anglo-Saxon world uh, use the word design, then usually it has a a rather artistic connotation. Yeah? It does not reflect both aspects, the mechanics and the aesthetics. Actually, in German, we have two expressions for that, yeah? and dwarf and bemessung. So the conceptual design we said is essential to achieve all goals to be complied by a structure. Yeah? What does it take to create compelling designs? First of all, we need, of course, intuitive understanding of load-bearing mechanisms. We need imagination. We need sense of form and beauty. And of course, also sound, analytical, and technological knowledge. Now, we can do with that something like a reality check. And without any doubt, there is a growing complexity in analysis methods, in verification methods, in materials technology as well, and also in construction procedures. Although, although if we look at pictures from the past and compared to the present, there seems not much progress. But there is progress, of course. And this progress 
somehow also leads to some speci specialization. Yeah? We think inside the box, not outside the box. Now we said before that the goals to be achieved are always the same in all structures. And we have to perform a series of activities to achieve these goals from the preliminary studies, design, execution of a structure or a building or whatever it is, the commissioning, then it is used, it is inspected and maintained, hopefully, until we come to the disuse. Yeah? And we have to fulfill serviceability criteria and safety criteria. And for all these activities, we have codes. And then we also have some control systems to control whether we apply correctly these codes. So to wrap up, the conceptual and creative thinking is falling victim to increasing specialization and extensive and opaque standardization and control systems. If we go back to the list of skills we need, then we see that actually, as well in engineering training, I don't know here, but generally it is like this, and of course also in daily practice, we con concentrate on analytical and technological things. Yes? Not even sound sometimes, but we forget all of these skills here. And this leads finally to an impoverishment of the profession so that we as engineers are becoming something like number crunchers or not even bookworms, but standard worms. And thus, that is the topic I want to talk about today. Yes? Let's see, first of all, uh, the case of bridges, then what about buildings? some words about the design procedure, and then I bring a series of examples. I will see whether we have enough time to see all of them because before we come to the conclusions. Okay, let's go back to the fundamental goals, safety, service performance, efficiency, and elegance. Yeah. We have codified rules for safety and service performance, and uh, actually, uh, to achieve this, this is a question of understanding of scientific principles and it depends on the analytical skills. Now with the economic and also environmental efficiency and elegance, it's uh, different. Yeah? There are no hard and fast rules and there are limited possibilities only of apprenticeship. The achievement depends on the creative talent of the engineer or the architect. Now, let's talk about the relative importance of the design objectives. The, this relative importance depends on the consequences arising when they are not achieved. So structural safety is the most important normally. Then we have serviceability, economic criteria, and also, of course, nowadays environmental aspects, and last but not least, the um, aesthetic aspects. Now, bridges and footbridges traditionally always have been engineering projects, and normally an appropriate balance was reached between economy and aesthetics. I bring here two examples. I could have chosen other ones, of course. Now, we were talking before about the impoverishment of the profession through specialization and normalization. To this, we have to add also the a little bit perverse, I would say, business model in the construction sector where the budgets, which normally are only notional budgets, do not really know the real price of things, and the tight execution schedules are dominant. And the budgets are linked to material consumption. And also engineering is seen by developers and contractors very often as an unnecessary expense. The result is that the industry, the construction industry, is more, one of the most polluting ones, and the results are not very, uh, very <coughs> happy, let's say. So, not everybody likes that, of course, so that there may be an increasing demand in some communities, at least, for more than just utilitarian public works. That means that the economic goal is no longer important, the form is more important. And if we talk about sustainability, everybody talks about it, but nobody cares about. And sometimes even the form is more important than service behavior. 
This also leads to a feedback between the social demand and the behavior of decision makers. To this, we have to add that through the modern methods and equipment for design and construction, virtually everything is possible. So that the mechanism is more or less the, the, the following. Yeah? We have our decision makers also in very serious countries, of course. They commission this kind of things to some artists. This is then built and they can inaugurate it, preferably uh, just before some elections where they then request the vote to the same people who have paid for this and also pay the fees of uh, our decision makers, but maybe they do not benefit from these kind of things, so they will also think about their vote. But we are not here to talk about politics, we are here to talk about structures. So let's go back to um, bridges a la mode, I've called them. Obviously, there is a threat to subordinate the structural system to some temporary fashions, so that the layout is conditioned by aesthetic uh, consideration with, uh, let's say, questionable results. In this kind of uh, solutions, cost effectiveness is not possible, of course, but we should not forget that bridges and public works in general, they are built with public funds, of course, and substantial extra codes can be justified in only very few bridges. Yeah? Maybe in the Emirates, we can say, okay, they have the oil, they have a lot of money, etc. They can do what they want, but they could also pay a little bit better their workers from Bangladesh. But if we do this also in countries like Spain, in, in um, periods of crisis, to build this kind of things which are then not used, then it becomes very questionable. Yeah? And um, we had the first crisis after the Lehman Brothers, Brothers crash, and since then we have many crises, of course, so that maybe priorities are changing. There is a demand for low-cost public works with low greenhouse gas emissions. So maybe we go back a little bit more to the roots. Yeah? In any case, we are searching optimal balance between economics and aesthetics. Some words about economics. We said before that everything actually depends on a good concept, also the cost, and it depends less on the optimization of span lengths or cross sections or sophisticated structural analysis. Quantifying costs is very difficult. They can only be estimated through tenders, but we will never know the relation between the financial offers and the real cost of the most economical solution. If it comes to aesthetics, then things are even more complicated because aesthetic is non uh, quantifiable and it is subjective. But there are a few basic rules which we can follow to avoid, let's say, visually disastrous solutions. Sorry about the quality of the picture. I took it from the book uh, by Fritz Leonhardt. He called this bridge a monstrosity. It would be interesting to know what he would call other things, more modern things. Let's see these some basic rules I'm referring to. The first one is integration into the landscape. So the layout of the system should be in terms of the predominant obstacle. And we should also respect the character of the landscape. For example, if we have a, a smooth countryside, we sh should select some balanced system. Visual efficiency, transparency, depends on the number and the shape of the columns. So the best thing would be not to have any column but sometimes we need some columns. And then uh, the transparency depends on the effective slenderness. Uh, no, sorry, it depends on the visual slenderness, not the effective slenderness, which depends on the ratio between the length of the bridge deck and the apparent height, not the real height. So if we have an efficient use of materials, at least apparently, in solution, solutions with a rather generous span lengths, then we have a visual efficiency. Order, equilibrium, and regularity are also good friends. So we would actually need a minimum number of bridge member orientations. And we should also seek a uniform ratio of the span length and the bridge head. The artistic shaping, that's a difficult one. Form following function design leads 
very often to very attractive results and we should in any case avoid inefficient members and also ornamentation. There is of course interaction between economics and aesthetics and the consistent conceptual design usually is also cost effective but not necessarily the least expensive uh, one. Why is this so? Because the econ most economical span length is short. I bring again this picture here and it seems rather ordinary. And longer spans are more transparent, suggesting technical efficiency. So for exposed bridges, aesthetic, for aesthetic reasons, uh, we may increase a little bit our costs. Of course, not very much. Now, what about buildings? In buildings, the main problem for us as engineers is the geometric translation of architectural and functional requirements to a rational uh, solution. Yes, what can we do with this one here, for example? And the quality of the structural solution largely also depends on a good cooperation between all the stakeholders, owner, architect, engineer, and contractor. And it depends also at the point in time when this cooperation starts. If you look again at all these activities, sometimes the cooperation starts very late in the process and also the degree of cooperation may be very low. Then we have, as engineers, we have no freedom to influence uh, in any way the solutions. So we can distinguish between different types of cooperation First one I call, I call here the game changer type of cooperation where maybe we may have a, such a brilliant idea that the architect will change his uh, original layout. This does not happen very often, but it may happen. The most uh, frequent case is what I call here the equitable uh, cooperation where of course the architect starts with the blank sheet. He is the responsible person to organize the space, but he listens to the engineer. There is a cooperation, as I said, and uh, we can find a solution which is satisfactory for both. Yeah? And also for the client, of course. And then there is the hierarchical cooperation <coughs> where we have the architect, he wants this, and we can make some uh, proposals to prove the solution, at least from a, a structural point of view, and the answer will always be no, sometimes with a thank you, and sometimes without a thank you. Some words about the design procedure. Again, this picture here. And uh, there are many boundary conditions, of course, related maybe to the construction work itself, to some of the processes, or to the natural and human environment. And demanding boundary conditions, they may be perceived, at first sight at least, as inconvenience, but they can also be a catalyst for particularly careful or even innovative uh, conceptual design. We should not forget that that we are engineers and ingenium from Latin stands for capacity of mind and also for clever device. So we first need a structural idea how to solve this problem in a way that it is compatible with all the constraints. This is the most important thing, as we said. We then develop this solution building on this idea, including very early or already uh, the detailing, because they are very important, we should do some viability check, viability check with a simplified structural analysis. And we should do also in this stage, the preliminary design of the main members and the main details. Yeah? And only then we start with the further design steps, analysis, verification, optimization, etc. And of course, we use all kinds of modern tools. And we see that if the conceptual design is well thought out, then we will have only minor changes in the further design steps. Now let's see some of the examples. I will start with the one from uh, the picture, on the announcement of the conference. This is a bridge uh, near Madrid. This, although it doesn't seem so, is a park. It is crossed by this highway. Here we have a bridge of another highway. Here we have a, a commuter development <laughs> with 
with uh, quite a number of people and on weekends it is, this park is heavily visited. It is divided in two parts, as I said, and people had to cross under the street here through a channel to go to the other side. So they needed here uh, a footbridge. Yeah? There were some boundary conditions, of course, regarding the geometry. No intermediate piers were allowed. The bridge landing should be somewhere between the columns of the viaduct. The bridge deck width should be around three meters. There were also conditions for the clearance and for the maximum slope. Regarding the construction, no interruption was allowed of vehicle traffic on the highway. And regarding economics and aesthetics, of course, the solution should be good, pretty, and cheap. So this is the original structural idea, the first sketch here. We proposed firstly a continuous pre-stressed concrete girder with a triangular section, reinforced concrete uh, piers and abutments, monolithically connected to the girder so that we would have an integral bridge. And the uh, layout should be meandering between the piers of the viaduct. Now, if we have curvatures, we have torsion, and we wanted to offset, at least partly, these torsion effects in the shafts and mainly also in the foundations so that we propose to slant uh, these piers. Now, we um, very soon then changed from a concrete comp uh, girder to a composite girder for reasons of ease of construction over the highway. So we came up with a continuous five-span girder with a total length of uh, 165 meters. Intermediate spans of the order of uh, 40 meters and the radius of curvature, very small, 58 meters. But we kept the idea of an integral system so that the reinforced concrete piers and abutments are actually connected to the composite deck. Here we have the deck with the uh, triangular uh, cross section. A triangular cross section is not very effective so that we introduced here a bottom flange inside. Uh, the section which in the um, hogging bending area we converted into a composite bottom flange so that we have a double composite action. Then we have a composite slab as well with profiled steel sheeting, lightweight concrete and uh, with an overall depth of the order of 15 centimeters. Now how can we connect these concrete piers to the composite girder? For this, to, to transfer all these uh, internal forces and moments. To do this, we proposed here a double diaphragm with two steel plates inside, inside the girder. With a, a void here in the bottom of the steel box for the continuous reinforcement. And then we filled everything with concrete to have a composite um, diaphragm. And here we have the result. So an aerial view here, the meandering layout here between the columns. And also the finishes, of course, they are very important, although there is no money left normally. So we used the washed concrete pavement. The railing was simply uh, constituted by uh, steel bars. The lighting, lead lighting was embedded in the composite slab and we also treated a little bit the surroundings. Yes. So the owner is the Ministry of Environment. We did the structural design and also all the technical work during execution. The main contractor and the steel uh, structure subcontractor, both of them did not survive all these crises. They do not exist anymore. Structural steel, only 90 tons. The cost was half a million euros. This leads to a unit price of 1,000 euro per square meter. So it's a very cheap bridge. The second one is also a footbridge. This, of course, is no coincidence. In the footbridges, we have uh, lower loads than in uh, road bridges and, of course, in railway bridges. And also, the requirements are a little bit lower, so we can ex experiment a little bit more. Yes. This is uh, another bridge in Madrid as well, over an uh, uh, urban motorway. Urban motorways, of course, are barriers to pedestrian traffic. Here we have the so-called Calle 30 in Madrid. So the municipality, they plan to enable a safe crossing at different places of this uh, motorway. 
And they organized a design contest uh, for six foot bridges. One of them was close to the so-called uh, La Paloma Junction. This is the reason why the footbridge is called La Paloma. Now the width of the ring road there is uh, 75 meters. One abutment is roughly eight meter higher than the other one and the vertical clearance should be at least six meters. The width of the carriageway should be uh, quite generous, more than four meters, because we have an office area here and here we have a station of the underground, so on rush hours we have quite a number of people there. Now, of course, if we go to a straight connection, then we would need a slope bigger than 4% and we would also not be able to uh, respect the vertical clearance, so we already know that we cannot use a direct uh, connection. And finally, uh, regarding functionality, also the user should be protected from solar radiation. Regarding construction, no interruption was allowed for vehicle traffic on the highway. There are, I think, 350,000 vehicles per day or something like that. Um, only occasional traffic diversions were allowed at night. Here, the structural idea, also here, it is actually a direct uh, result of the sum of the functional and site constraints. We proposed a continuous spatial truss girder with an open C-shaped cross-section with a slanted web here, and then a Y-shaped uh, piers integrated into the truss so that the upper branches here, they are at the same time also diagonals of the uh, web truss here but with larger cross-sections than the normal diagonals. And in a minute, we will see the reason why. As I said, uh, for the requirements of clearance and slope, we need a curved layout. So we came up with a continuous four-span girder with the intermediate spans of uh, roughly 50 meters and the side spans of 43 meters. And the radius of curvature is also uh, quite small here, 68 meters. Here is the bridge girder, constituted by three trusses from steel members with uh, welded box sections. So we have a truss here as top flange, a truss here as bottom flange, and a truss here as slanted way. The slab also here is composite with profiled steel sheeting and uh, concrete with an overall depth of 23 centimeters. Now, let's talk a little bit about the load transfer mechanism. We have vertical loads, of course, and the curved system, so we have torsion. Since the cross-section is open, we have warping torsion. That leads to differential bending of the top and the bottom flanges in their planes. And finally, it leads to horizontal reactions transmitted by the flanges to the pier branches and finally to the pier shaft so that we have bending moments in the pier and also in the foundations. Now, we do not only have torsion, we also have uh, bending, of course, in the, in the bridge girder. This leads to tension and compression in the flanges. And since it is curved, it also leads to deviation forces here, which must be introduced or they produce some reactions also in the columns are transmitted to the columns and produce also bending in the piers. Now, we have these two effects, torsion and deviation forces, and they produce opposite signs of bending moments in the piers. But the torsion is dominant, so that bending moments are not completely offset. And this is the reason why we enlarge the branches of um, the columns, which, as I said, are also diagonals in, in the web truss. Now, um, as I said before, already in, at the conceptual design stage, we have to think about the details. If we look at this kind of joints here, between the columns and the truss, then we have uh, seven members connected together. And due to the load transfer mechanism, we need rigid connections, otherwise the system will not work. So we need a lot of internal stiffness, etc. And we should arrange the different plates in their most effective position. That means that we should avoid, as far as possible, direct stresses in welded connections and should prefer shear stresses. 
Now, how can this be being built? Also this, we should already think at the conceptual uh, design stage, although I will show, of course, uh, pictures from the real construction. First of all, the abutments and piers are built, of course, with uh, micro piles in this case, then reinforced concrete pile caps and abutments, and then we pre-installed pier shafts, but without fixing them to the foundation, we pre-installed. Then on a, uh, on a place nearby the uh, construction site, the uh, curved spans are pre-assembled, you can see here, then they are positioned on the top of two sets of uh, twin towers, as you can see here, and these towers in turn are positioned on a, a self-propelled movable trailer. The height, of course, of these towers, this is not uh, coincidentally, it depends on many parameters like the slant of the footbridge itself, the necessary clearance and also the gradient and the camber of the road at the place where we install uh, this segment. Then, in a nighttime operation, the trailer is passing the median. It then uh, is driving on the roadway to the side. And uh, arriving there, it turns around, it approaches, and we have uh, two temporary supports here where it is supported, the segment, to take away the movable trailer so that at 5 o'clock in the morning we could open again uh, the highway. Then we positioned the, um, the shaft of the pier by using some chucks there. It was then welded to the, to the joint, yeah, to the upper part of the column. Then the void between the steel plate here and the um, pile cap is filled up with a, with a grout. Then the anchorage bars are pre-stressed and at that time we can remove the temporary supports. Also here, the finishes are of course important. Again, we used the washed concrete pavement, the railing here with an inboard slant to avoid that children could climb up. Sewage system here, then the lattice work cladding here uh, to provide shade for the pedestrians. Of course, in the project we have some, we had some um, um, uh, stainless steel mesh, but there was no money left for this kind of thing, so we needed the, this lattice work and also the lighting. We had to go to the cheap solution. Here we have the, an aerial view of the um, finished bridge with the top flange here, the truss of the top flange, as you can see here. By night, it looks very nice in a very harsh environment, actually. And also here, the data block, the owner is the city of Madrid. We also did here the structural design and all the technical assistance during execution. There was a main contractor, steel subcontractors, specialist subcontractors for the movable trailer, 321 tons of steel and 2 million uh, cost, total cost. This gives a unit price of the order of 2,200 euros per square meter. This is the most expensive bridge we have ever done, actually. And maybe this is the reason it was also awarded. Let's move now from the bridges to buildings. I have two buildings, from concrete, by the way. The first one is a courthouse at El Fido, in the south of Spain. Here we have the um, conditions for the architectural design. It was also a design contest. The shape of the plot is triangular here. The built area should be of the order of 8,000 square meters to accommodate eight courts of law and other uh, judicial bodies. The access should be possible from the forecourt and there should be a separation of the different flows of use. So the architect, the winning project, uh, proposed a trapezoid a floor plan for 7 meters time 55 and 26 for the bases and two architecturally and functionally completely different volumes with the frontmost unit with a vertical nature here with a height of uh, 28 meters. It houses the services most heavily used and ensures the different connections. 
It also has a floor lobby here with a 20 meter ceiling. And then in the rear block, we mainly have um, file rooms in the upper stories. Some of the most important elements here, we have the forecourt, the floor lobby here, here a gallery hanging down here with a glass curtain wall. This is the waiting room with this 20 meter uh, ceiling I mentioned before. Then we have a main facade, we will uh, see in a minute. The courts of law here, the file rooms here, and then some uh, gangways here. Now the basic ideas for the conceptual design. We are in an area where we may have uh, some seismic actions, not as in other places uh, around Europe, but still we have seismic actions. So we have to ensure robustness, of course, particularly uh, of this uh, potentially vulnerable facade, which is integrated into the global system and only has a few, three exactly, horizontal supports by these uh, passerelles. So we said, okay, we will conceive a monolithic system made of ductile in situ reinforced concrete members, but we can also use, of course, prefabrication. This is compatible with criteria for robustness, as long as we provide sufficient strength in the connections and sufficient energy absorption capacity. So let's see at the, um, the overall system, as I said, we used reinforced concrete members for the slabs, diaphragm walls and columns. Only here in the file rooms we used composite beams because of the high loads, the rather important span lengths and the restriction in the construction height and also in the allowable deformations. And here we had uh, 10 steel trusses to hang down this platform here, this gallery. Uh, there also we have some interesting details, but we will not talk about that. I will rather talk about the main facade. So it is uh, constituted by nine rows of vertical precast concrete elements and cast in place self-compacting -compa concrete cords here. Please note that the vertical members, they are not aligned. Now the structural function of this facade, it receives uh, vertical loads here from the roof, but also horizontal loads from wind and seismic action. And at the same time, it is also a diaphragm wall to stabilize the whole building. But still, we built it with uh, precast vertical members because the geometry was rather complicated with L-shaped um, cross sections with different widths here for these uh, wings. These wings, the perpen uh, this wing uh, here and also the front wing, they are not connected to the core so that the load bearing cross section is only this one here. And the uh, cords, as I said, they are cast in place, one meter wide and 25 centimeters thick, but only this center part is actually resisting and connected to the vertical members. So due to the lack of alignment, we have locally important bending moments and shear forces. This is the reason why locally some uh, cross sections, we had to go to composite cross sections, including here also, U-shaped uh, or C-shaped profiles. Now the joints in this system are of course very uh, important, otherwise it will not work. So we have the precast members, vertical members here with looped start bars, which are penetrating into the cores, but the anchorage length of course is not sufficient. So we introduce uh, transverse uh, reinforcement here with a dowel effect and also to pr produce a ductile node behavior. Now, how can this be built? We had a tubular uh, scaffolding system inside and outside of uh, the facade, which was growing together with this facade. Yes. So the precast elements, if you look at the cord Y, for example, the precast elements, they are hung from transverse joists here, yellow or orange, which in turn are supported by um, longitudinal profiles. 
um, and they transmit the forces here to the vertical posts of um, the scaffold. So once these um, elements are in place, we can cast the concrete cord with self-compacting concrete. Of course, during construction, this whole system is very vulnerable and it is constituted by the facade on the construction together with the scaffolding. And there may be some interaction. So we have to analyze actually very carefully the whole system, analyzing also these possible interactions. So this is much more complicated actually than the final system. Here we have to resolve the waiting room. This is what uh, the idea of the architect was at the stage of the, of the contest. And this is what we have in the end. And if you see that everything is very similar, then we are quite happy. Also with this outside view, this is the model from the contest, and this is what we have in the end. Now the uh, last example is called the Plastic Cathedral. I think we will see in a minute uh, why is this so. <laughs> we are now moving from the south of Spain to the uh, Canary Islands precisely to Tenerife, where we have the historic city of San Cristobal de la Laguna, with a typical urban structure developed in Latin America during colonization. This is the reason why also it was declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1999. The cathedral, of course, in this context is a very important building, but it always had uh, some problems. 100 years ago, there were some settlements and it had to be rebuilt completely, except the facade, the main facade, which uh, was kept from the previous building. Yeah? And it was rebuilt then because this, uh, the responsible engineer, military engineer, he had been in France and he learned a new technique to reinforce concrete. So he noticed that with this technique, he was able to lower costs and to shorten construction times. Now, we are on an island. The technique uh, is scantily proven then, of course, it was a new technique. So the aggregates, they were taken where they were, probably from the beach. Actually, in the later investigation, we found the sulfates, chlorides, seashells even, etc. We also had a concrete or a material not be called concrete probably nowadays, um, with a very high porosity and a low electrical resistivity. And at this place here, we have very, very high relative humidity and also filtrations of rainwater. So we have all the ingredients for uh, deterioration. Actually, there were many deterioration mechanisms going on in the reinforcement, in the concrete, etc. So that the local authorities <coughs> pieces were falling down from, um, from the roof. They decided to close the, um, the cathedral again, only 100 years after the reconstruction, the re previous reconstruction, and they even frayed and they propped completely um, the roof. We were then asked to do a structural assessment, which showed that reliability, structural reliability was fine, but it was not possible to detain deterioration mechanisms with any of the known methods. Also, any, um, any repairing would have been associated with a lot of technical difficulties and uncertainty. So we recommended actually to demolish the roof and also the main dome again and to rebuild this roof, maintaining the main facade again and also the lower part of walls and of the columns. Now, as I said before, we are in a heritage context and if you tell heritage people that you want to demolish something, they get very, very nervous. And they asked us, okay, please make it uh, possible that at least we can maintain the um, main loan. Please do some further assessment. We did that, of course, but unsurprisingly, the result was the same. Reliability was okay of the dome not kill any dome as long as the um, support is okay. But uh, there are severe damages in the concrete, reinforcement, etc., which you cannot detain and also repair would be very difficult. So we, our recommendation actually was the same. 
And after long discussions, it was decided to do so, to demolish and rebuild. So we are in one of these crises of the last uh, 10 years or so. So there is a stress field, I call it, here between architecture and economy. The structural members to be rebuilt is from this level here upwards, yes? So we have to rebuild these short columns, substituting the uh, capitals we had before, then all the arches and all the shales. <coughs> the geometry from the 1930 cathedral should be respected, but we also wanted to, the architect and decided to improve it. The appearance, firstly, with proportions to the golden ratio everywhere. And also, we wanted to improve the natural lighting and the ventilation because there was a lot of humidity, the smell was very bad. So we decided to introduce openings on top of all the domes. <coughs> Regarding the moldings, the moldings here, the new moldings should be fixed directly to the structures. And at the same time, they should be completely aligned with the existing moldings on the lower part, which uh, where we um, kept actually the existing, the existing columns. Yeah? Now, as I said, we are in the Great Recession. There is no money. So the contractor, of course, wanted to reuse the old ancillary elements um, for nominally equal domes. But there is the problem. They were only nominally equal. In reality, they were not equal because column spacing was not equal. So we have actually incompatible requirements. Yes, the contractor wants to reuse its uh, formworks, etc. And the, um, if we do that, then the moldings directly fixed to the structure will not be aligned with the uh, existing moldings from the old structure. And this gives a lot of geometrical problems. Now the structural idea. We said, okay, in situ concrete domes are best suited to fulfill all the boundary conditions. So we wanted a monolithic system with no expansion joints. That means that we have to connect not only the new elements between themselves, but also the new elements to the existing ones. This also gives a good robustness of the whole system. Then we said, okay, corrosion is a problem. We will not use any uh, steel there. We rather use uh, polypropylene fiber reinforced self compacting concrete for the shells and also glass fiber reinforced plastic rebars for the short columns and the arches. Here we have uh, the model, the geometrical model of the whole roof, and the typical dome uh, is represented here. As I said, it should be everything monolithic and everything connected. And the structure member, the, the short columns, they had square or circular sections depending on the core of the existing ones here. You can see the surface after demolition. And the arches should have T cross sections where the shell is integrated to the, uh, uh, to the downstanding ribs. The thickness of the shells would be eight centimeters. And then uh, on top here, we need some compression ring for the lighting and the ventilation. Here we have some detailing, longitudinal reinforcement in, um, in these ribs with four bars, and then we have some transverse um, loops every 20 centimeters, and also some connection, some um, bars, towel bars here to connect the shell where we don't have any reinforcement and uh, these ribs. And of course, we have the post installed. Sorry. We have the post installed um, starter bars here to the existing part or also to the existing walls. Regarding the materials, of course, um, regarding resistance, we have much more than what we need. The main dome there, we follow the same principles, the same materials, also only the cymborio here. We have uh, big volumes of concrete, so we introduced polystyrene cylinders for weight reduction. Then, as I said, uh, we did uh, the third project development uh, with many geometrical problems. We also experimentally uh, determined the uh, concrete mixture, etc. And then we convinced the first the architect and also the contractor to build a prototype. 
we told him this is an investment, it is not a, an expense. Yes? Before the construction, yeah? full scale prototype, as you can see here. Why? First of all, we wanted to review the whole process for the geometrical translation of the 3D model to the real structure. Everything goes fine. Then we wanted to establish the most suitable construction procedures, and also the resources involved, and also to adjust the concrete mix from the laboratory to site conditions. And finally, since it was there, we also tested the dome up to fail. Yes, but this was only a sub-product. The main lesson was that there were many difficulties for concrete casting where there were some obstacles. Yes? That's the reason why we decided then to use the um, fiber reinforced self compacting concrete only for the shells, but not for the um, elements where we have reinforcement. There we would use only self compacting concrete without fibers. Yeah? So we have to uh, pour the concrete actually in two stages because we have two different materials. It was also good to optimize the openings in the outer formwork for the bottom-up concrete casting. And it was good to see that you should avoid any, any spaces actually between the inner and the outer formwork. This is the reason why we then used external stiffeners to the outer formwork to avoid any uh, spaces. So everything went fine, actually. The um, existing structure was demolished. From this level here, the, just below the uh, former capitals upwards. Here you can see after cutting one of these columns. Then um, the new roof was built by groups of domes, each, as I said before, in two stages. And even the pinnacles and all decorative elements were prefabricated from the same material. Now, as I said very, uh, several times, we are crisis, a never-ending crisis, so there was no money actually in the end uh, for these moldings on the new elements. So it would look like this, yeah, these are the existing, the old elements, and these are the new ones, and then we try to convince uh, the, um, the owner and also the architect that he, they should at least install these moldings up to the to the capitals, we, because we said, okay, if we would have known, we would have uh, designed a uh, more elegant, let's say, capital from concrete. But the uh, architect said, no, 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 we will leave it like this, not only for reasons of, uh, of um, lack of money, but also to represent the story of the country in these years. Yeah. Finally, uh, it was kept like this. Construction time were 24 months. Mm -hmm was open to the public in 2014. Overall cost 7 million roughly and 5 million roughly for the structure. And this is how it is. looks like from the outside. Inside we have very nice um, views inside here, the ale and the nail. And uh, to close this part, actually there was controversy during the whole process Firstly, as I said before, the partial demolition and reconstruction of a protected building was severely criticized by some experts, and also some authorities. And then also the use of innovative technologies and materials. They said, okay, 100 years ago, they used a new material then with a completely, uh, it was a disaster. We had to rebuild the whole roof 100 years later. Yeah? Now the Swiss guy comes and he wants uh, again to use new materials and we will have to uh, rebuild the, the, the structure maybe in another 100 years. Yeah? He wants to use plastic so we will have a plastic appeal. But new challenges nowadays can be assumed thanks to modern engineering methods not like years ago and material science of course. Then the completion of the, of the work was within the stipulated time, time and I would say at a very reasonable cost, and where we had a very heavy looking, uh, dark, bad smelling cathedral, we now have lightness, brightness and freshness, so that actually the acceptance by public and also by the experts was rather enthusiastic. This brings me to the conclusions. 
I have to try try it to explain why the conceptual structural design is important, that well thought out concepts will undergo minor changes only in further design steps. On the contrary, if the concept is poor, then we will possibly never achieve the design goals, although we do very complicated and very sophisticated uh, calculations. Unfortunately, this step is underestimated as well in engineering training, of course, in daily practice in favor of more and more specialization, which implies an impoverishment of the profession. In our view, of course, we cannot avoid increasing technological complexity, not want to avoid it, but it calls for more, not less conceptual and creative thinking. Okay, this was my message of today. Thank you very much for your attention. No, there was no quality control for the project. But for the materials, and the execution and, and the geometry, it was also in the interest of the contract, of course. Otherwise, um, it was the architect. He was there every day, actually. He was a local architect. And actually, we, we were in Madrid. We did not notice all this um, controversy, not that much. Yeah? But he had to live with that every day. Yeah? And of course, there were other architects, they would have liked to do this project, of course, and they hoped that it would fail. <laughs> now, it's true. <laughs> uh, I have a question. How, how, how do you think that we can mitigate this uh, uh, excessive emphasis on technique? and calculations and at the expense of conceptual thinking in, in this environment in education? I, I think this would be the first step. Of course, we need, we need technical thinking and we, we know that everything is more and more complex and we should not try to impede, of course. <laughs> we have to, to use all the new tools, but we should, we should learn to start with a blank sheet and, and, and um, you say hand, hand, uh, hand uh, drawings. I think there, there should be some courses on that, not only in architecture, also in, in engineering. I think it should be, if, if it is cancelled from the program, it should be reintroduced. And I think, I also think that we should, in engineering training, students, so professor, they should study actually masterpieces from the past. We learn a lot from that. And not only bridges, I think, also art in general, and of course architecture, etc. Et Maybe it could be a good idea also to have le lectures together with architects and, and engineers, some lectures, so this kind of, of, of matters, subjects, or even even during um, engineering training, why not do some common, um, common work, develop a project so that students can learn this cooperation? I think uh, everything starts with the education. I think, I think we have a uh, learning from history. We have, of course, uh, some more drastic measures like. Uh, the monastery of the Bahia celebrates some battle that we don't want to talk about. <laughs> but uh, uh, the dome failed two times. And, and, and the builder, engineer, or the architect, as you call it in those days, uh, was, had been replaced because he was becoming blind. So they brought him back. So the challenge was he said, Yes, I will be. And I'll stay underneath. So if it falls, it falls on my 
I have <laughs> shows. I, I mean, perhaps more drastic uh, <laughs> testing, real life testing, <laughs> like this could solve this issue. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> But um, anyway, I, I think we, we should, as engineers, we should be able to develop um, solutions which are pleasant also to normal people. Otherwise, it will be very tough for us as a profession. I, I think we could disappear as a profession, yeah? because there are, I don't know here in, in Portugal, but in Spain there are the, um, industrial engineers, and uh, they will do everything. And then the architects, they will, they will go on. But civil engineers can disappear. If, not, if we are not able to develop good solutions, I'm quite convinced. Yeah, it very much depends on the country. We, we now have we participated in different tenders, for example, in Malta, and they're the only things. The only thing that counts is the price, nothing yes. else. And in other countries, it's the same. Yeah? Whereas, for example, in Portugal, I think you had a very good competition in Porto. I think the aesthetics was very important. But in the end, we are. Uh, sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, we, we also we did even won some uh, design contest in, in Switzerland. I know in the jury there are people sitting uh, which are looking at the estates. So it very much depends on the country, I would say. But of course, it's, it's difficult and subjective. that we think about it and maybe we can organize a longer seminar here in which we can do something with the students. Yeah. Right, so I don't know whether you have uh, lectures where you learn to design a bridge by hand. For example. I, I'm the, um, the uh, civil engineering school in Madrid, sometimes they, they invite me and probably also other people give some lectures on, on bridge design. What, what can you do with a blank sheet? Yeah? If you have a lot of constraints, etc. And then I usually bring some exam with me. I tell them the constraints and then I distribute some blank sheets. And then I tell them, okay, please you have uh, 10 minutes or half an hour, I don't know, yeah, to design something. Yes? And you know what the question normally is. Whether this counts for uh, the final exam. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on the student, I would say. Yes. Of course, uh, as I mentioned several times, we are not at all against uh, modern tools. We also use all of them in, in our office, of course. But a blank sheet is also a tool. And I think it depends very much on, on, on the engineer uh, who is dealing with, with the project. There are engineers, they only like to do their models, nothing else. Huh? And there are engineers, they like to start with the blank sheet. I like to start with the blank sheet. I would not like only to calculate, of course. 
So it, it very much depends on, on the, uh, I would say, the personal interest. Yeah? Maybe it is also due to the input I had uh, when I was younger. That's the reason why I, I showed these pictures in the beginning. Yeah? When the, the one with the ice sculptures it was Heinz Isler. Yeah? He was the genius of the, of the concrete shells. And this was his method for form finding. Yeah? There were no computers at that time. And then I also had a Christian Men as, as a professor at MTH, so they opened a little bit my mind. Yeah, too. <laughs> so for, for me, of course, it is fundamental. Also the detailing. If, if you don't start with the blank sheet to do uh, some detailing, it, of course you can calculate everything. Yeah? But it even works. But the performance cannot be the same if you do not really think how it should work. Sometimes we say, uh, also my colleague uh, Juan Luis, who could not come today, uh, if, if we have uh, a lot of time, we also calculate something. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it's not true, we calculate a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just curious, uh, this is like you put bridges, as an example, I think you have a very experience with this, pretty much it bridges the uh, for itself. No such thing as a code that we follow and we try to follow some rules. So you have to make the model for each bridge pretty much uh, separate. So, and we, we are so much used to use some rules and then it's so convenient to follow some rules and to classify the, the but, safety. Yes. And, and my question is do you within your company uh, gather some rules after some experience? And it's after 10 bridges, bridges you, you collect some rules and then like, you, you provide some. Some new guidance for no, not really. This is a question of, of let's say, intuition and uh, experience as well, of course. And of course, we are looking what others are doing as well. Uh, you, you cannot invent every time a new system. That's that's for sure. Yeah? You, you can you can maybe um, invent some improvement somewhere. Yes. But rules, of course, you have to you have to fill the, the safety requirements. The safety requirements are there, yeah. Of course, we, we then model everything and also dynamic calculations, of course, in footbridges. They are very important, of course, yes, of course. But the initial design is, is really, as, as I showed, yeah, these are two or three examples I showed. These were, were really the initial sketch solution and then when you compare the sketch, the initial sketch with the final solution and if you see it's, it's really what you wanted, then you're quite happy. But um, also in, in our office, for example, it, everything is free to contribute when we have to design an, a, new, a new bridge, any bridge, yeah? to, to propose some solutions, but many people, they, they are not really interested. Tell me what I have to calculate. Yes? That's a pity, I think. But we cannot do many, many of these footbridges every year because otherwise uh, we would have to close the office. In this kind of projects, you usually lose a lot of money. <laughs> so, thank you very much.